Thanks, Doug, and welcome to everyone. It really is a pleasure for Doug and I on behalf of CAFC to welcome you all to the third webinar in a very exciting FASD webinar series. Uh, in partnership with many FASD experts and researchers, organizations across the country and beyond Canada's borders, CAFC has facilitated the development of a national screening toolkit for children and youth identified and potentially affected by uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Our webinar series began in March um, of this year, of course. On March the 7th, we welcomed um, many folk from across the country and beyond to what we called uh, FASD, an in-depth overview and national dialogue with our experts. And the two uh, presenters uh, were part of our national steering committee, and that was Dr. Sterling Claren and uh, Christine Locke, both from uh, BC. Our second webinar took place on April the 6th, and I was honored to co-present with Dr. Corin and what we focused on last month was the screening toolkit itself, overview of the um, methodology and criteria and definitions, et cetera, that were used in the development of the tool, which really began in 2007. The tool was officially launched as a living document and a work in progress in October of 2010. Um, the, what we're planning to do on the next three webinars, and we'll, we'll repeat the dates for everybody um, uh, at the close of today's um, uh, webinar, but at this point we're going to drill down a little bit and touch and feel and learn more specifically about each of the individual tools. And as Doug mentioned, today's focus is, going, is, is actually is, is twofold. One, uh, and we're going to start this on the Maternal Drinking History Guide, and the second will be on our meconium screening tool. At this point, it is truly my pleasure to just give you a little bit of background on our two uh, colleagues and uh, speakers who will be um, sharing their tremendous knowledge, expertise, and passion uh, in this area. And uh, they are, of course, uh, we will be welcoming back Dr. Giddy Corrin. Uh, Giddy is a professor of pediatrics, pharmacology, pharmacy, medicine, and medical genetics at the University of Toronto. Uh, Dr. Corrin is the founder and director of the Mother Risk Program and a professor of pediatrics um, at the um, at U of O. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I just I just brought you to Ottawa, Giddy. My apologies at University of Toronto and of course is a staff pediatrician at the Hospital for Sick Children. Um, Giddy has co-authored hundreds, literally hundreds of scientific articles and book chapters and, uh, and abstracts and I know is no stranger to all of us online today. Uh, Dr. Corrin is also the founder of the Fetal Alcohol Canadian Expertise Network referred to as FACE and the peer review journal of FAS International. Truly a pleasure once again, uh, Giddy, to acknowledge your tremendous contribution to this field and to welcome you back to today's webinar. Um, Dr. Momita Sarkar um, is going to lead off our presentation today um, and really bring us through the development of the Maternal Drinking History Guide. Momita, it is my pleasure to welcome you. Dr. Sarkar has over 10 years of professional experience in diverse areas such as health, education, as well as prevention strategies. This encompasses research, coordination, presentations, as well as multiple publications. Specific to our, to our work together, since 2000, Momita has held the position of coordinator for the Alcohol and Substance Use Helpline with the Mother Risk Program at Sick kids in Toronto and as well holds a PhD from the Institute of Medical Sciences, University of Toronto with a collaborative degree in addiction medicine. Um, 
her doctoral thesis focused on use of evidence-based screening strategies, very appropriate, of course, to today's presentation, to identify women exposed to alcohol and other recreational drugs. This led to the development of the Maternal History Guide that will be and has been incorporated into the CAFC uh, screening toolkit. Um, without any further ado, it is my true pleasure to welcome you, Momita, and to welcome Giddy, and to turn things over to you, uh, Momita, um, for your first presentation. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. So today I'll be discussing the Maternal Drinking History Guide. This tool is necessary for improve, improving identification of at-risk women and hence reducing risks for both mother and child. So for today's presentation, I'll first be discussing alcohol and pregnancy, um, why it's important to be screening. Then we'll go over the three levels of screening that has been identified from a systematic review that was conducted to see all the evidence-based and validated methods of screening for at-risk women. We'll then go over, uh, we'll do an overview of the three levels of screening and where they would be most appropriate in terms of use. Then there'll be some take-home messages for providers and if time permits, a case study that we can review. So we are all aware of the fact that it's been almost four decades since alcohol was recognized as a teratogen. Um, what is less known is that most of the women who drink or continue their alcohol use in pregnancy are not just done by alcohol, alcoholics or alcohol dependent women. Rather, the most prevalent type of drinking are um, done by women who engage in what is known as problem drinking behavior. This refers to the amount of maternal drinking that's associated with harm to the fetus. The NIAAA uh, guidelines suggest any woman who drinks, who is binging, that is having more than four or more drinks at one sitting, or an average of seven or more drinks per week, is considered to be a problem drinker. Of course, if a patient is pregnant or planning pregnancy, in her case, any amount of drinking would be considered risky or problem behavior. Um, in terms of effects of alcohol, the main and primary effect of excessive alcohol consumption in pregnancy is referred to as fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. This is currently the leading non-genetic cause of brain damage. Now, the effects of this disorder can range from mild effects to very severe effects known as fetal alcohol syndrome, which is manifested as not only growth impairments and distinct facial features, but also um, severe uh, mental retardation. Now, the effects of FASD can be categorized as both primary disabilities, which refers to the organic damage that's done in utero um, during the pregnancy, which can, which, which can lead to physical birth defects and CNS deficits that can result in learning disabilities, memory problem, short attention span, etc. These deficits in turn can lead to much longer secondary disabilities such as trouble with the law, not being able to keep uh, a job, drug and alcohol problems, disruptive uh, behaviors, and low self-esteem. So how do we prevent all of these exposures? Well, in an effort to reduce the number of alcohol-exposed pregnancies, what is very, very important to do is routinely screen all child-bearing women for their alcohol or drug use. Also, it's important to educate and help them understand why no alcohol is best in pregnancy. And finally, to assist them to stop drinking through information, counseling, and referring them to appropriate programs and services. It's understandable that um, this doesn't occur routinely because there are several barriers. First of all, the most prevalent type of drinking behavior, which is problem drinking, is 
primarily done by women that come that are quite high functioning. They have full time jobs. They have college degrees or higher. They're, they come from higher socioeconomic status. So often they don't. They're not um, portraying the symptoms that you'd expect of someone that is dependent on alcohol. From the provider side of view, um, lots of survey studies have suggested that lack of time is. Uh, one of their main barriers to why they can't screen routinely. Um, they have not been trained adequately and they're not comfortable about uh, asking or approaching women about their alcohol or drug use. And also very importantly, there's really no resources that they can then take the next step to. In an effort to prevent secondary disabilities, what has been shown over and over through a large body of literature is that the earlier a child that was exposed in utero to pregnancy um, can be diagnosed, the earlier interventions can be put in place and so that there's better outcome for the child in the future. Now this has to be done by early childhood interventions um, can be done by providing the right type of stimulation having access to smaller classrooms, providing the parents with support materials, etc. Now to have an FASD assessment done, there are several requirements that is necessary, that are necessary. For example, a referral by a doctor is required. Um, the assessment has to be complete involving physical, neurological, psychiatric, gen and genetic examination. And most importantly, confirmation of knowledge that mother did indeed drink in pregnancy. So without these, um, without these requirements, of FASD assessment cannot be conducted. So that then was necessary to develop a maternal drinking guide. And the purpose of this tool is twofold. The first is to determine if the mom drinks or drank at a problem drinking level in pregnancy. Um, and this can be done through a positive screen on the tweak or her describing her drinking levels meeting the NIAAA guidelines. And secondly, to obtain accurate maternal alcohol use report because knowledge of her use is not just essential for the diagnosis of the child, uh, for FASD diagnosis in the future for the child, but also to put in place harm reduction strategies for better outcome for both mom and child. So when should screening occur? When should these questions be asked? Well, usually when a new patient comes into, um, into the clinic, the initial visit is also always important, and this should be followed up with subsequent visits. In pregnancy, the key times are at initial visit, at the annual gynecological visit, um, and every visit after that. So every time the patient is asked, they're more likely to reveal more. Is there any knowledge or expertise that's required to complete this tool? Well, simple answer is no. There's really not much that's required. Everyone can use it, whether it's the healthcare provider, frontline healthcare provider, um, addiction worker, everyone is, uh, is capable of using this due to the, um, there's no training required. Now, what has been shown to be quite effective is incorporating the screening questions into standardized health questionnaires that a provider would normally use when they see a patient. And these questions can be incorporated among other innocuous questions that's related to lifestyle. For example, do you take daily vitamins or do you work out? How many times a week do you exercise? Do you have any other medical problems? Do you take prescription drugs? Routinely asking questions regarding alcohol and drug use, very, very important because whether a patient is, whether the woman is pregnant or not, Having a documentation of how much she drinks is always important because that provides a power, that serves as a powerful predictor of what she might continue doing in pregnancy, if not at least in the early stages prior to her knowledge of pregnancy. Moreover, if a patient is used to being asked about alcohol before pregnancy, 
she's less defensive about it during the pregnancy. So in terms of the three levels of screening, the first level is referred to as practice-based screening. This level of screening um, incorporates just one single question, and this has been shown to be uh, and has been validated as effective in identifying at-risk women. So just asking one question related to alcohol or drugs um, was enough to identify more women than not asking any at all. Now, motivational and support, motivational interviewing techniques and supportive dialogue in combination to this one question um, in, makes up the practice-based screening. The second level is made up of structured questionnaires. This can be twofold. If the practitioner is comfortable with direct questions asking about quantity and frequency about alcohol, then they can follow something like the timeline follow, timeline follow back tool, where two weeks of or a week of what her usual pattern of drinking can be asked, or it can be done in an indirect or mass screening fashion by using brief questionnaires such as the tweak or take. So it is at this level, at level two screening, that the determination of whether her alcohol use is problematic or not becomes evident. The third level of screening is based on um, lab-based screening. So this is referring to biomarkers that are available um, and can be and if they are de sorry, detected, uh, can be indicative of alcohol use in pregnancy. So how do we begin the screening process? Well, the first thing one can do is simply introduce um, himself or herself and before the standardized healthcare questionnaire is filled out and say, well, I want to ask you a few series of questions today about your lifestyle. Now, I ask all my patients these questions because it really helps me to get to know you better and provide better care for you. From there, um, as the standardized health questionnaire is being filled out, amongst other questions related to the patient's vitamin intake and other uh, medication intake, um, any presence of any mental health problems or uh, exercise questions. A single question can be asked, so do you ever enjoy a drink or two? Or when was the last time you had a drink? Um, do you sometimes drink beer, wine, or other alcoholic beverages? So this is the practice-based level one screening. To help this become more accurate or effective, motivational interviewing techniques have to be um, incorporated. For example, when asking questions, one should avoid things such as that would uh, suggest a negative response, like, you don't drink, do you? Rather, something like, do you sometimes enjoy a drink or two would elicit a much more uh, positive response. Supportive dialogue. Um, to engage, to help engage the patient more would be, examples would be, can you tell me a bit more about your drinking pattern before you knew you were pregnant? Or, so have you been able to stop or cut down since you found out? Now, moving on to the level two screening, which refers to the brief questioners, upon um, confirming that she may be drinking alcohol, whether it's at a social level or at a more risky level, this level of screening will then go on to identify whether it is at, um, at a risky level. So this can be done in one of two ways, either the direct questioning or the indirect or mass questioning. The indirect screening is done through brief questionnaires like the tweak or taste, which have been developed specifically and validated for use among pregnant women and women of childbearing age. Because these questions target and focus more on the tolerance of um, alcohol for the women, and thus it overcomes issues of under-reporting. Now here's an example of the tweak test. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this or not, but this has been shown to be uh, one of the most effective 
to use among women who are pregnant or planning. Um, so it's made up of five different questions, and it's scored out of seven. So a woman who scores two or more on these questions out of seven will then positively screen as a problem drinker. Some of the questions, the way that tweaks can be introduced is, well, now that you, I know that you do enjoy a drink or two, I'd just like to ask, uh, get an idea of how your tolerance is to alcohol. So how many drinks would it say it took to make you feel the first effects of alcohol, um, or in cases of pregnancy, worded to before pregnancy? And if she responds to three or more drinks, then she gets two points. Similarly, if she answers yes to any of the subsequent four questions, then she's assigned a point of two or one, adding up to a total of seven. Moving on to the third level, which is the lab-based screening. Um, the, this level of screening is quite accurate. However, it is also quite expensive and invasive. So it has to be limited to scenarios where there's um, discordance or where child protection fees are involved. Now, the main biomarker that uh, lab-based tools can detect are for, for women who, to detect, to identify women who are at risk or drank in pregnancy is the fetal alcohol, fatty, sorry, fatty acid ethyl esters or FAEE. And this is essentially a byproduct of, um, of alcohol. Now, I won't go into details about this because Dr. Corin will be uh, speaking about it in much more detail. But essentially, the FAEs will deposit in both hair as well as meconium. So these two tests can then um, positively confirm whether mom did drink in pregnancy or not. Now, once we're aware of the fact that mom did drink, um, during her pregnancy or she does elicit problem drinking behavior currently, it is then important to take the next step and educate her on what the effects are and inform her and get her the help if it's welcomed. So um, what one can do is perhaps tell her something like, well, here's some information that has been learned through research. I'd like to share it with you. or open it up and leave it as an open-ended question so that you get a better understanding of what her risks are and say, well, what is your understanding about alcohol use in pregnancy? Do you have any questions about your alcohol use that you'd like me to answer? Now, on this slide, I have tried to put together the three levels of screening, and um, perhaps we can uh, I can clarify to you how it might be used most effectively. So when a patient is presented at clinic, um, the provider can start with an introductory statement, as I mentioned before. And then as the standardized health, health, standardized health questionnaire is being filled out, a single question to confirm if alcohol is part of her lifestyle or not can be incorporated amongst other questions. So a general question for everyone is, do you ever enjoy a drink or two? For a youth or teen, um, the question, do you or your friend's party has been shown to be most effective? In the cases of pregnant women, something like, can you tell me a bit more about your drinking pattern before you knew you were pregnant? So these are the different types of examples. Now, upon confirmation, that she, alcohol is part of her lifestyle, it is then important to determine if um, she's at risk of continuing her alcohol um, consumption upon getting pregnant. And this can be done through a, three different options, as I mentioned before, by asking questions related to how much and how often she drinks, or indirectly by applying the tweak test and seeing if she has tested positive or screened positive. Now, if she does, um, if she is identified as a problem drinker, then brief intervention is very necessary. It is important to educate her and advise her on what the potential risk is as with a lot of empathy and then
then refer her to the right resources and services that um, would be most appropriate for her. But if she's not ident identified as a problem drinker, it is still important to educate her on what the potential risks are in pregnancy and encourage the fact that, you know, um, that no alcohol is best in pregnancy. In both cases, um, it's always important to follow up at subsequent visits, continue asking questions about alcohol, and um, intervening if required down the road. Now, the third level of screening, as I mentioned, does indeed require full informed consent and is limited to cases where um, child protection agencies might become involved or where provider feels there's definitely um, something that there's a high index of suspicion, yet um, the self-report is not con in concordance with that. Now, to improve accuracy of self-reporting, it's very important to uh, start out with innocuous questions such as, when did you find out or suspect you were pregnant? This is a very um, general question, but it's been shown to be, uh, it's shown to be very reflective of what her potential risks are. For example, if a patient who normally has a 28-day cycle finds out at uh, the end of her second, or midway through her second trimester, um, it's important to find out why. Uh, in some cases, a lot of women that do drink or use drugs are often in denial and don't want to seek help. So that is important to know. Uh, it is also important to start off the sentence, well, did you know that over 50% of pregnancies are unplanned? So there's a lot of women that unknowingly are exposed to alcohol or drug use. So before you were pregnant, where you, or you became aware of your pregnancy, was there any exposure to alcohol or did you enjoy a drink or two? But most importantly, routine screening of all women at every visit is really important. So some of the recommendations that came out of a joint task force that was done by the FHGC and um, Public Health Agency of Canada and Motherist um, as outlined for you here. These are, well, during reg regular health exams, healthcare providers should use standardized questions that should include at least level one screening, which is practice-based screening. Early identification and reduction of maternal drinking is better outcome for both mother and child. And also to always inform patients that there's really no known safe limit of alcohol use because there are a lot of um, mixed information out there that patients um, tend to access and they're often confused as, as to what really is uh, the, the the real risk. Now, level two should be adopted as a standard screening process to identify alcohol use uh, in all women of childbearing age and pregnant women. Healthcare providers should use the lab-based screening methods when there's discordance between the first two levels or doubts remain unresolved after level one and two screening. And finally, upon screening, women need to be linked to programs and services if required by their providers. Record is very, very important. The frequency and amount should be recorded in a women's chart on a routine basis and not just during pregnancy. And this information then needs to be trans transferred to appropriate healthcare providers and in the newborn chart and child health records to ensure a continuum of health. Because without this information, if the mother is not in the picture anymore, the child can still have some way of getting diagnosed. Some of the triggers that healthcare providers can look for um, that has been found to be common among women who are at risk for um, continuing their alcohol consumption is poor prenatal care. Um, dual disorders are a common phenomenon among these women with several mental health problems that they might not be aware of, so that needs to be investigated as well. Poly drug use or concurrent drug use with other recreational drugs. Um, especially stimulants such as cocaine and meth, these are very commonly used in combination with alcohol. And so asking about 
um, alcohol if someone reveals their illicit drug use is important and vice versa, asking about these illicit drugs are also important as they're highly predictive of each other. Once um, the woman has identified her alcohol use, you can then refer her to services uh, such as mother risk where they can provide a little more information on what the effects are uh, due to exposure to these drugs. There's uh, for diagnosis or to, for referrals in a service um, near them. Other programs include Best Start, um, Canadian Center of, of Substance Abuse, uh, the PRIMA program, the ADAC program, and Healthy Choices in BC. I've listed here some relevant publications that uh, someone can refer to that basically summarizes everything I've talked about today, as well as some publications that serve as guidelines for healthcare professionals that are caring for high-risk women uh, that may use cocaine or alcohol in pregnancy. Lastly, in terms of going, I wanted to go over a case very briefly, um, just as a method of, um, as an overview of what we've discussed. For example, SS is a 34-year-old patient you have known for 12 years. She's often combative and can be both assertive and aggressive towards other people, including yourself. She's now pregnant and you've never asked her about her alcohol use. So what would what a practitioner do in this case? Well, um, the first thing would be to start off with the introductory statement and then once um, the healthcare standardized healthcare questionnaire is being filled out, um, the level one practice-based question where a single question about alcohol can be embedded among other questions. From there, if alcohol use has been confirmed to be a, a part of her lifestyle, um, in this scenario, the indirect method of screening is probably better as a level two screening. And so the tweak can be employed. And if she does turn out to be a problem drinker, and screens positively for that, she can then be provided with uh, interventions of, and education about alcohol and be referred to the services that uh, is most appropriate for her. So I thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. All right, thanks, Momita. That was a great presentation. And this is just another, gives me an opportunity to remind everyone to, uh, if you have questions throughout the session, just feel free to type them into that question box. And it's at points like this during the presentation where we'll be able to take a few of those questions. Uh, there's just a couple questions. One of them was about the PowerPoint presentations um, and are they going to be available. And of course, as I mentioned at the top of the presentation, all of the information related to this webinar will be available on the Knowledge Exchange Network at www.ken.capsi.org. And that will include the, the audio-visual recording of this webinar as well as the PowerPoint presentations. Um, the other question was uh, back at the beginning uh, when you were going over sort of the uh, description of, of, of sort of describing the, the population uh, of, around pro problem drinkers. And Sheila has asked, what percentage of women are problem drinkers? OK, that's a very good question. Um, so according to um, US stats, problem drinking occurs in up to 18% um, among the 24% of women. So up to 18, as high as 18% of women uh, do have problem or illicit problem drinking behavior. In Canada, the numbers are up to 12%. All right, thanks. And as always happens, once we ask the first question, that's when I guess people don't believe me until we actually a ask and answer a question. That's when all the questions start coming in. So we, we did get a couple more. And, and again, someone's asking about the web page for the PowerPoints and stuff. Everyone that's on this webinar will get an email uh, with all of the uh, web addresses and everything to connect, uh, to get all the information following. So it's always hard to, to copy down an email address when uh, over, over voice like this. So don't, don't worry about that. We, you, you will receive an email from us when all of this information is available. Um, the next question was about was also from Sheila, and it's about self-report accuracy. Uh, what is the role of public health policy and messages? Okay. Uh, sorry, could you repeat the question? She's, what she's is the saying, role of uh, role of, of public health policy and messages? 
Well, I mean, the main role would be that is what this whole initiative was um, essentially to try and help improve. Um, the main role is for prevention, right, is to help providers that are caring for these women to understand how to most effectively engage and prevent these women. Uh, sorry, prevent these women from continuing their alcohol consumption. So engagement is very key, and I think that's where the public health is coming in to develop initiatives such as this to, um, I guess, better uh, to, to help providers understand how they can improve on this aspect. Um, the next question is about uh, the screening tools that you referred to earlier. This is from Michelle. She says you often refer to the tweak screening tool. Can you share your reasons for using this tool versus the TACE? Absolutely. So the, tw the tweak and the TACE have both been validated. And um, let me just go down to that slide. Okay, so the, I had the tweak up because compared to the tweak, uh, sorry, to the taste, um, the tweak has actually been found to be much more effective on a diverse um, racial population. So uh, as opposed to the taste, which was primary, most of the studies were done on minority populations. The, the tweak was found to be slightly more um, in terms of sensitivity and specificity to have, uh, to be more effective than the taste. However, both of them are quite, I mean, there's not much of a difference. It's just the type of population that uh, they have both been validated in. Um, we prefer to use the tweak in, uh, as part of the Mothers Program because we do get a, a, you know, patients from a, a wide range of backgrounds. Thanks, Romita. We do have a few more questions, and there will be time um, to answer those as well. Uh, I, at this point, I'd like to uh, once again welcome uh, Dr. Giddy Corin back to the uh, to the virtual podium. And Giddy is now going to uh, walk us through uh, on a on a very sort of just in in detail and and give us a really good sense of the uh, meconium uh, screening tool. So Giddy, my pleasure. Welcome back and thank you again for your leadership. It's a pleasure to be here again and uh, we're very glad that we have an opportunity to, to share with Canadian uh, colleagues uh, coast to coast uh, work that took three or four years to complete in terms of what can help us. Uh, the common denominator of uh, Mumita's and my talks and those tools is and in, a, in an attempt to estimate how much alcohol the baby saw, actually, or mom used and the baby saw. And for, for obvious reasons, which were shared by Mumita and many of your questions, some inherent problems with maternal reports. Moms have very many reasons not to report on alcohol, which is, of course, the leading preventable non-genetic cause of birth defect. Um, why would mom want to tell us necessarily if it's associated with, uh, with of course, embarrassment, with guilt, um, and oftentimes with the, with the feeling that she may lose custody of a child. So as one of the questions suggested, the self-reports by nature in this situation have an inherent issue. Um, how can we find out what happened to a baby if he or she cannot report to us? Um, well, here are some studies to show why we may want to know even if mom does not tell us. As you may know from other readings and what was covered in previous, previous uh, webinars, there are studies now suggesting that one in 100 Canadian kids are inflicted by some degree of the spectrum of the FASD. Um, of course, the minority will have the full spectrum, but many other will have many other effects that are not part of it. Unless you have the full face recognition, 
you must have knowledge about mom's drinking, which for obvious reasons quite often will not be available from maternal, from maternal reports. Second question, which is related to the first, why do you do all this effort to identify these kids early? I think Mumita answered it. I'll, I'll re, re challenge us all because I think it's a key point. Our colleagues often ask me, the brain was damaged already. Why do you care to know about it? Where is, what, what can you do about it? Well, studies from Straska in Seattle and other later clearly show that early interventions bring about much better results. Very probably because early diagnosis or detection will lead to interventions early. And this is very strongly shown now by animal studies where you can create in the animal fetal alcohol syndrome and you could show that if you randomize these pups of, of, of mouse or rat into high stimulation versus cage life, those with the high stimulation programs are doing much better. And when you look under the microscope, you see regeneration of neurons. So early detection is key. There's another point, of course, which we should never forget. If you detect a baby through meconium, as you will show now, that is exposed to excessive alcohol, you identify a mom who is alcohol dependent and likely to have other kids with FASD and, of course, likely not to do well herself, both in terms of her own health and, of course, in the context of rearing children. And so let's talk about this fatty acid ethyl ester or FAE as a biomarker. The conium, as you all know, is the first bowel movement of the baby. It has a consistence of uh, anchovy paste. It doesn't look like later stool. It's unique because, do remember, starting with the time that the baby is swallowing at 14 weeks of gestation, the baby pees and swallow again the same aquarium water for six months. So things trap in the meconium, in the GI to get out afterwards. So in a way, the meconium becomes long-term memory of what went through the baby. That's the idea. By the way, the context of this, it's not just for alcohol. It's also for any drug of abuse you can think. And the mother risk laboratory is now doing thousands of tests every year to identify babies that were exposed to cocaine, heroin, and a list of about 30 different drugs of abuse, where the context, either the health context to the baby or for the protection agencies and ability of mom to rear a child are important. Now, it, this test may be superior to blood and urine. First of all, we will not find FAEs, in a minute we'll define them, in the blood and urine, not for long periods of time. The conium is discarded, it's being thrown out, so there is no ethical issue. Uh, and the collection is easy and non-invasive, as I'll show you, the large population studies we have done. Now, do remember, this meconium will start produced only at 13 weeks when the baby begins to swallow. So if mom did alcohol in the first trimester only and stopped it altogether by 12 weeks, we will not detect it. So this is one of the limitations. However, from that limitation also comes the strength of it. If we do find meconium positive, it means that mom did alcohol at large doses long after she knew she was pregnant. Because by 12, 14, 16 weeks, most women know they're pregnant. This is sin equanon of addiction. No woman wants to damage a baby. Most Canadian women know that alcohol is not compatible with pregnancy. So if mom has a positive meconium in a baby, it means she did it long after she knew she is pregnant. So even if the baby looks quite okay at birth or even later, it means that he or she are reared by mom who is alcohol dependent. Shouldn't we know about it? Yes, we should. Big way. Now, how is 
just going back to university for a minute, not for too long, how is alcohol break, broken down? As you can see, mostly by oxidation and the minority by non-oxidative. Now, what it means, when ethanol meets on board in our body, fatty acids, they produce or they are synthesized into fatty acid ethyl ester. This compound stays much longer time than ethanol itself. So that's the basis here. As you can imagine, the problem of alcoholism is not just in pregnancy. It's a huge epidemic, many areas of life, driving, liver, social life, psychiatry, and so on. So a lot of people are looking for biological markers that can tell you if someone has just, did, has just done three glasses at, at Christmas, or is this a long and problematic drinking? So that's where it's coming from. In a way, typical to pediatric medicine, we often take tools developed by the adult guys who ethically and otherwise can move faster than we do. Now, I'm not going to show you all the data, but some of it. These are studies, some from our center, some from mostly originally from Case Western in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, showing that the meconium positive for FAE as a reflection of alcohol predicts, in this case of bearer study, predict the amount of mom's report of drinking. The same in Toronto. The same again by Cynthia Bear. Here's a study from the US. Lower APCA scores when one particular FAE, because there are many fatty acids, many FAEs, correlation with low birth weight. The same shown by us in Toronto. Moreover, more and more studies now show that high meconium FAE correlate with IQ and other neuropsychological tests. Today on Earth, probably the place with the highest rates of maternal drinking at the alcoholic range is in South Africa. And again, the American group showed correlation of FAE now with FAS itself, or partial FAS. So we are moving more and more. Here's a study we did with, with our colleagues in, uh, in, in, in Queen's University. This time we took guinea pigs where you can, you know on, on the gram how much alcohol you gave them, and you see total FAE in the meconium of these pups correlated both with birth weight, but more importantly with brain weight. So here's a direct proof that the FAE reflect how the brain is developed. And this is what we're interested in. We went on to measure it in uh, Montevideo, uh, 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 in Uruguay, and again showing very similar results. I should tell you there are many more studies today to that effect. I just show, I chose a selection just to show you that this is correlating. Now, one point I did not show you, the difference between finding FAE in the, in, in the meconium versus finding cocaine is the body does not create cocaine. So if I find cocaine in a baby, mom had to take it. The body does create alcohol. We all create some alcohol by fermentation of, of fruits, grapes, and other fruits. So all of us have some FAE because we have some alcohol. And what we did to validate the test and not blaming women who should not be blamed, quote unquote, I do not mean blame, of course, was to test a large group of very religious Muslim and Jewish women in the Middle East who just don't touch alcohol. It's against the religion. And we found out what you can find in their meconiums, babies' meconiums. And we said arbitrarily, Anything we measure up to that level, which happened to be two nanomolar, everything below that, we cannot be sure that it's ex exogenous. And everything above two was set up by us as the test. I must tell you, most positive cases we see in Canada are not 2.1, 2.2. 2 
but rather 20, 30, 50, and 100. So these are very, very high level. I think this is a repetition of something we saw, and I apologize for this. Uh, let me show you now what we did in terms of population to see that we really can do the test. This is, this is uh, the gray Bruce area, and we chose Owen Sound and the gray Bruce because it's a relatively small area with very active health unit. This is where the Walkerton disaster happened with the E. coli, and the health unit is very, very listening, very much listening to, to, to things that can avoid those disasters. So what we did in that area of Ontario, we went and found out what's the rate of excessive meconium in the population above the two I mentioned. Very briefly, the study. At that area, people believe that they see more alcoholism and alcohol use than in other parts of the country. Uh, we didn't confirm that part, amazingly, actually. The average is very similar to Ontario in general. Uh, they believe that they have rate of heavy drinking among females of about 10 percent, which is very similar to Ontario and to Canada. Uh, so, so the primary objective was to collect meconium from everyone in an anonymous way. So no way we go back to women. We wanted to see how acceptable this are, uh, these, these new means are, uh, and to see what do we find, how much we find. So the collection was anonymous. A mom who didn't want to participate just didn't put her diaper, and the diaper into an, a nail and bag, so we didn't collect it. It was kept frozen and then sent to Toronto to be measuring. Uh, the consent was wavered by the fact that mom had actively to give it to us. It went through ethics, of course, both at the different birthing units and hospitals, as well as the University of Toronto and the Hospital for Children. It was about a year of work. There were five regional birthing centers. There were midwives. And these were the centers. And the nice thing about the Owen Sound or the Grey Bruce, it has a relatively middle-sized town. It has First Nations, it has Mennonites, it has agricultural communities. In a way, a capsule of Canada, and not necessarily just urban, suburban, and so on and so forth. Um, and we did include all the midwives, too. I just show you here how the GCMS method looks. And I think it just show it uh, how we measure. This is negative. You still have different peaks, of course. This is positive for three of the fatty acid ethyl esters. Every fatty acid will give a different fatty acid ethyl ester. So altogether, uh, 682 samples were successfully analyzed to a rate of about 2.5 to 3. I don't have time to do justice for all the statistics, but about 3% positivity. It goes for 2.5 to 3.5. Now, this may look to you small, but actually it's very high. These are babies exposed to problem maternal drinking. What you see here is, uh, if you go by questionnaires asking mom about drinking in pregnancy, you find much, much less. You see, orders of magnitude less. And that's by anonymous surveys. But maybe more relevant to this is, uh, let me find it. I'm sorry. I may not have it right. Yeah. Gray Bruce itself used the Parkins questionnaire, which is asked everywhere in Ontario. I think it's being replaced now slowly. But there's one question about yes or no drinking by mom, which is, of course, as you heard from Mita, hardly can be enough. But you can see that the same year, only 0.5% of moms disclosed using alcohol, whereas we found almost 3% high use of alcohol. So it's an order of magnitude that would have been missed. 
between five and eight fold different. So really this method, now, what does this mean for the rate of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder of Canada? You may know, and it was discussed in, by Dr. Clarence and Locke, about 40% of babies whose mom drink heavily have the syndrome, the fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, 40%. So, if 3% of moms drink heavy so the babies see a lot of FAE, 40% of 3% is 1%. And 1% is the more widely accepted figure for FASD in Canada. This time confirmed by a biochemical test. Now, here is the second part. Okay, so I showed you that it's effective epidemiologically to show the size of the issue, to identify areas that may have more of an issue. How about non-anonymous use or screening of women and going back to them? With ethics approval and with approval of the ethics in the Grey Bruce, we started offering this test to women of the Grey Bruce area that go to give birth in London, Ontario. The high-risk women are sent to London, Ontario. This is a high-risk unit. And parents are invited to participate and of course as ethics will dictate they are not, if they don't want to participate, they don't need to. Quite a few women did not want to participate as you imagine. But here I want to give you the first positive baby, show you the power, the immense power of this test. Mom said yes, I drank a little bit. She was an unmarried 19 year old woman. The meconium level was 57. Remind you, 2 is our, is our set for normal. The, what does it give us? The Grey Bruce Public Health Unit participating in this mobilized help to this mom who is single, living in a basement. Three months after birth, the biological father of the child left home, uh, and she's now a single mother. And we not far away later, developmental delays were identified, allowing us to do full-scale IQ on the baby and to mobilize help. So this is the penultimate steps needed to take this finding to move forward. Now, positive meconium test is not sine qua non of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, but it is a requisite. You must have high exposure of the baby. So in a way, we are now moving to its ability to identify the babies. Uh, these very important ethical issues, can you do the test on whom you can? I don't have time to cover it all. I'll be very happy to answer some questions about it. But the, a, a, a primary user of the test today throughout Canada are the child protection agencies. It's the first time that they get a real sense of what the baby was exposed to. It's important for them to know. A lot of studies, both in Canada and elsewhere, show that mom who is addicted actively have many issues with rearing a child during the very problematic first years or challenging first years. It does not yet mean that the baby cannot stay there, but the baby and mom need a lot of help. So this is an objective means to do so. Um, it is used by quite a few physicians over the country. The case was never yet at court in Canada in the sense, do you need permission of mom or not? I can tell you, talking to hundreds of us throughout the country, there are many physicians that believe that the same way they can check VDRL to confirm congenital syphilis, they should know if the baby was exposed to alcohol. And as you know, on, almost on the same wavelength, when you have to test for HIV, there is a whole song and dance. So we as a community and Canada as a community are not yet very firm about how to go about it. Uh, during this year face meeting in, a, in, a, in PEI, we will have a national discussion about the ethicality and the legality of testing, mom's right, baby's right, and so on and so forth. Uh, I will stop here. In summary, I produced uh, evidence to show you 
a new screening tool which now become very, very popular use in Canada. It's sensitive and specific. The decision who should have it or not will differ in different communities. Very often before the people on the ward know whether the baby will be taken by children aids or supervised by children aids, before they lose this immensely important information, they deep freeze the sample so you don't lose it. Because once you lose this opportunity, you may for life lose the evidence and show that the baby have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and not something else in the differential diagnosis. Thank you very much. Thanks uh, to both Gideon and Momita. Um, Gideon, I've got just a couple questions for you, uh, and we'll give uh, Momita a little bit of time to uh, sort of get, back, get her head back on straight and ready to answer some of the questions that came in from before. So just a couple quick ones for you, uh, Gideon. The first one, why are levels of acetyl acetyl aldehyde levels not measured if the majority of ethanol breakdown is oxidative? Excellent question. Acetyl aldehyde is very short-lived and it disappears very quickly. Its measurement is a nightmare. It's done in laboratory context, but not routinely clinically. It also costs a lot. Of course, to measure something that will be a biological marker, you need to ensure that it's stable. So the main reason is that. Uh, and of course, because it's so short-lived, you could also ask why to measure, not to measure alcohol itself. Again, alcohol is very short-lived. Here we have a long-term memory of exposure. Uh, I didn't have time to go through it. Momita did mention we can measure the same FAEs in mom's hair because it accumulates one centimeter a month. I wish we could measure acetaldehyde, but aldehyde in general are very, very finicky, almost impossible to measure clinically. All right, thanks. Um, and this question came in uh, during Momita's presentation, but you may be able to answer it uh, while you're here. Gideon. It says, are you aware of any link as evidenced in research between marijuana use and alcohol consumption? Yeah. In fact, mother is because we are measuring hair and meconium a lot of drugs of abuse. The answer is yes. In general, women and men, for that matter, who do drugs, do drugs. And they very rarely do one drug. Um, marijuana is associated in many people with alcohol. The truth is, though, that marijuana and alcohol are soothing compared to cocaine, methamphetamine, and so on. So more common you will see someone on cocaine taking marijuana to, soothe, to smoothen the, the crushes that they have. But in general, Marijuana users use alcohol much more than the general population, no question about it. Which means for us that one of the criteria that should tell us that the baby may have exposure to alcohol is the fact that he has other drugs on abuse on board. The same with the parent. All right, thanks. Um, someone has asked if uh, the references from Momita's presentation for both the Canadian and U.S. statistics for problem drinking can be posted, and, and that will be posted along with, uh, as part of the PowerPoint slides that will be posted on the Knowledge Exchange Network. Um, one of the questions was, uh, and for either Momita or, or Gideon, um, if alcohol has caused a visible birth defect, such as a cleft palate or crossed eyes, does that child necessarily have brain damage as well? Yeah, actually, uh, you should know that alcohol, the fetal alcohol spectrum disorder not commonly cause cleft, for example. Interestingly enough, in terms of major malformation, put aside the brain, most of what it does, it's the facial changes, which are not debilitating and not socialized, social-wise. You, you have to really know how to pick them up. Um, mm -hmm. But back to your question, yes. In general, a child that has the visible malformations of alcohol almost always have also the brain damage. Uh, although there are different targets, but do remember these mums, the problem drinker mums, drink heavily 
and for a longer period of time. It's very rare for them to be able to stop it abruptly because it's, it's an addiction. So yes, that's why full-blown syndrome, namely babies who have the facial changes, oftentimes other malformations, but not statistically clear yet, such as oral cleft, it's not. Cardiac malformation is probably more than the general population. But yes, the brain in, almost invariably will be affected. All right. Um, this next question is, uh, is actually a bit of uh, information to add to some of the inf information that was presented in uh, Momita's presentation. Um, and this is coming from Shelley Burchard in Alberta, and it's quite long, so just bear with me as I, as I get through it all. She just wanted to put it, uh, just to provide a little bit of information, um, she says, uh, to, to help the presentation stay current. She says ADAC, which I believe is the Alberta Agency for Drugs and Alcohol, and I can't remember what the C is for, but um, she says it's no longer a separate entity, but has been integrated into the province-wide Alberta Health Services. Uh, the, webs the website is albertahealthservices.ca. Okay, uh, that's very good as, to know. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, that's important for us. And uh, for other listeners, the Mother is line that's run by Mumita and her team uh, advise women throughout the country about resources, what's available. And we update that regularly exactly for that type of information. So please, 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 if you know of any resource in your area, even remotely related to this very vulnerable women and their children, do let us know because we will add it and update it. All right. And she, she continues on to say, uh, as for connecting with services specifically regarding FASD, um, the, the following website has been has information on the 11 FASD networks across the province of Alberta, and it can be found. And she provides a website here that I'm actually going to pop up on the screen for uh, everyone to see here. So I've got on the I've got on the slide that should be popping up on your screen in just mm -hmm. a second. Uh, the um, the Knowledge Exchange Network address, uh, which is where all of this information will be posted, you can see that at the top. That's the one the individual was asking for earlier on. That's the, uh, the one that's www.can.cafc.org. Um, and the other one is, what, is the one that Shelley uh, Burchard is talking about, which is the fasd-cmc.alberta.ca slash home. But you can see it up on your screen there. And Shelley also included uh, uh, that everyone can feel free to contact her if they need any more information. She's with the Government of Alberta, uh, Alberta Health and Wellness with the Community and Population Health Division and is the co-chair of the FASD Cross Ministry Committee. So thanks to uh, Shelley for providing all of that information. She says on the, uh, the FASD-CMC website uh, are the initiatives that the FASD 10-year strategic plan that has been put forth as a joint ministerial, ministerial plan in 2008. She says we're there in year five of, of the 10-year plan. So but thanks again to Shelley for providing that, that great information. Um, the next question is about uh, is, is about the meconium again. Uh, it says, how far back does the hair test or FAEE indicate that alcohol was used? And she continues on to say, did she hear that you say that the mother's hair is used and can the ha baby's hair also be used for FAEE testing? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, meconium, as I said, go back to 13, 14 weeks when the baby begins to swallow. Uh, and we confirmed it both in, uh, as I said, throughout the country. We are now doing a large study in PEI, the first ever done there. It was done in animal studies to show that it's a real thing, both in, uh, I, I showed you some guinea pig, uh, was done in sheep now by us in Australia also. Um, the hair, the hair test for FAE comes from Berlin, where a group of forensic scientists established it, kind of the same concept. If it's in the blood, it should grow into the hair, similar to drugs of abuse. And uh, interestingly enough, the Berliners didn't even know how to spell fetal alcohol syndrome. They did it for driving, drinking. That's the question there. After they established it about 10 years ago, it was accepted by the courts there for drinking, driving, and you have to prove that you don't have a certain level of FAEs in the hair. We adopted it. We went to Berlin to learn the method. We approved it later, and we use it more and more now in the Canadian context for adult drinking. We are now downscaling the essay for the babies too. 
The potential advan advantage, of course, in adults, every centimeter is one month. So the centimeter closest to our scar is last month. The next centimeter is two months ago, three months ago, and so on. So we can tell not just yes or no, but also when and how much. Baby's hair, of course, grows in the last three months of pregnancy. So it will miss mom's heavy drinking in the first and second trimester. But its big advantage, once we establish it, is that hair stays on the, hair, on the head of the baby for three, four months. So the window of opportunity to measure it is much larger. And by the way, we do it for drugs of abuse now. When the meconium was lost, there is no meconium, we can do baby's hair for up to three months. We, have, we need very little amount. And that's, of course, the reason, the challenge to do it in baby's hair with FAE, because you have to downscale the assay to be able to measure it in much, much less hair than in adults. But it's upcoming. I, I think we will see the test. Uh, we are working on it very hard. All right, thanks, uh, Gideon. And when you said Australia, that reminded me, right at the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned about sharing this information across Canada. I just wanted to comment that we have people from all over the world attending these webinars. On this webinar here, we have people from Australia and New Zealand, as well as the United States as well. So as much as we, 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 we want to share this across Canada, we are reaching a lot more people than across Canada, which just uh, d demonstrates the, how interested people are in learning more about this important topic. I'm just going to hand it over to Elaine. Uh, she has a question for uh, our presenter. Thanks. And, and as Doug said, it's just wonderful to, to have so many people online today. Momita, if I could sort of target um, this question to you, can you speak to what the data are telling us about the reliability of the, uh, the, the integrity of the data that, is re that you're getting back from mums uh, when the maternal drinking tool is in fact implemented? Just around honesty about you know reliability of the data and 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 what 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 is the what is your work and what are the literature telling us in, about this? Okay, absolutely. So I mean to begin the 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 presentation that I have uh, the findings came from um, essentially a systematic review of all the different types of evidence-based screening tools that are currently being used from around the world. And this was done as part of an initiative um, that the SOGC and Public Health Agency of Canada and uh, the Mother Risk Program um, had put together in an effort to increase effective screening in women of childbearing age. So in terms of the three different levels of screening and how the uh, maternal history guide was developed, it's all based on evidence-based methods. So that's the first question. In terms of how that, um, how the, this approach can be applied, I'll tell you that we use this approach, um, the techniques every day on the Mother Risk Program. In terms of engaging women, uh, we have tons, we have about close to 20 women each day that call us, they um, are calling us first. Some of them are uh, just concerned because they've been exposed in early pregnancy. And then uh, they might report one or two drinks. But as we go through the structured questionnaire, we incorporate the techniques that I have described to you. Eventually, you find that they're drinking a lot more. And in often cases, they will reveal that they continue to do so. So it's, the advantages of these techniques are not just from the literature, but they're being applied every day to our program. And I can tell you that they're quite effective from what we've found. That is, that's fantastic. I really appreciate that, Mumita. I'm going to turn back to Doug. We actually have a couple more questions. Um, this one's uh, coming in from one of our uh, previous uh, uh, presenters, uh, Christine Locke, has, has said that uh, both alcohol and smoking increase the risk of oral facial clefts based on large multinational studies. So she would add that timing is critical. The timing of alcohol-induced clefts is around the time of FASD facial feature development, day 17 to 24, so that many kids with clefts may be missed unless you, unless you ask 
screen or look for other features such as palpebral fissures, uh, developmental delays, more than only the speech issues caused by clefts. So her question is whether meconium screen for FAEE might be done for all new babies with clefts, about 1 in 700 births, recognizing that the early exposure that increased the risk for producing the cleft would be missed, FAE, after 14 weeks. But if positive, this would alter our counseling of recurrence risk if alcohol was one of the multifactorial agents and prompt more support for mom and baby? Yeah, this is an excellent question. First, I should say one of the problems with the epidemiology of oral cleft versus FAE is, as, as Chris said in her own comment, uh, is that almost 100% of alcohol users smoke. Smoking was shown now epidemiologically beyond doubt as a cause of oral cleft. So how to sort out the alcohol without smoking is still, I don't believe the verdict is still out. But that said, still the idea of, of screening babies with cleft for, maternal, for exposure to alcohol in pregnancy is a, is a very, very good idea, actually. And uh, I believe uh, one of the biggest questions that is asked about the meconium why won't we do it as a screening for every baby if so many women are drinking to some extent or not always disclosing it? And by doing it on everyone, we take away both the framing and the blaming and everything that goes with this. And we just bring much more acknowledgement that this is an issue. Of course, this is a big question that has to be asked uh, in any forum. But Chris's idea of uh, doing screening for babies with specific birth defects that are at least suspected or, 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 or linked to alcohol is a great idea. Thanks, Gideon. And that's actually all of the questions that we have here. Um, so I'm going to uh, ask you to sort of change gears. I had a phone call and, and just got an email from uh, someone who's actually participating on uh, the call today. Hopefully she's listening because I was just going to ask you this quick question that's actually in relation to one of our upcoming webinars. Um, she's just at, and The upcoming webinar is about the neurobehavioral screening tool. So again, as I said, it's a bit of a change in gears here. Um, but she was wondering uh, if there are any FASD diagnostic clinics that are using or piloting the neurobehavioral screening tool as part of their admission criteria. Yes, I think I can answer that as part of the team. Uh, of course, CAFC team uh, working on this. After we painstakingly chose several tools that the team felt have enough epidemiological strength to be offered to Canadian physicians and health professionals as screeners, we said, OK, but we have to validate those by future studies. And that's exactly what we do. So for example, the tool developed at the University of Toronto, the Near Behavioral Screener, which is a, a list of a, a very short list of questions coming from the Achenbach Child Behavior Checklist, which has high sensitivity and high specificity for FASD. That tool was shown and published from the University of Toronto. They revalidated it again in another sample in the same clinic. But I'm I'm glad to tell you that as we talk now, the study is being validated in Edmonton by uh, uh, Dr. Rasmussen and his uh, team's work will be validated by other. If you are participating now is interested, are interested to, 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 be, to be part of this validation and implementation phase, please let us know because we will be very happy. Of course, a condition for that must be that you have a capacity for the diagnose. Because, of course, this screener has to be shown to work against the diagnosis because it's what the predictive value of screening is. But by all means, it's being now validated. And I, I do hope we get more people interested to participate in this effort. Thanks. And as I was asking that question, someone did come in with one more little question, uh, last question about the meconium. So, um, Sheila said, if we could address the stigma and shame that appears to be at the core of women's withholding of accurate information about alcohol use in pregnancy, we would be able to address this within the concept of harm reduction. 
Her question is, what fear have you that the meconium testing will contribute to women hiding their alcohol history or avoiding prenatal care for fear of losing their child? These are, these are excellent, excellent questions. No question about it. Uh, presently, of course, the test is not available clinically throughout the country. It's available for those who want it, but it's not that it's not screening for HIV, which you have to op opt out now. For this one, a physician will ask you. And of course, we have huge concerns about exactly what Sheila said. Uh, one way to overcome it is, of course, uh, changing the culture. It's not necessarily easy. Part of our effort to answer this, we are doing uh, focus groups with different stakeholders. And interestingly enough, both here and in Alberta, a woman who are alcoholic or alcohol dependent or problematic alcohol users are asked. Most of them say that if this if if this was not labeled people and people were not chosen because of A, B, and C, it, if it would become a national screener for everyone, it, they felt. Of course, this is just a, a group. They felt that it should be okay. So clearly, like many other aspects of the fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, is the shame, is the labeling, it's everything that causes most women not to come forward. And I, I want to make it sure that none of us is talking about snapping uh, meconium or hair from anyone. Everything has to be done in the ethical context. I just made a point to make it clear that the ethical boundaries are not yet clear. The only time we'll know what we can do is when it's in the court and the and judge tell you his or her interpretation of the Canadian reality. I can tell you that thousands of Canadian doctors at present time use the test, or I should say more hundreds than thousands, but because they claim that it's part of what they need to know. Um, the question of hiding, just again, this is a topic we can talk hours. I will just make my last point. Drinking in pregnancy is not a reason to, for children aids to do anything, because women are totally emancipated in pregnancy. It's only drinking after pregnancy that children aids come in. Children aids does not follow kids in, uh, moms in pregnancy unless they had history and so on and so forth. So there are elements here that if we do the right things and really thinking about how to protect the baby but protect mom also, we may be able to do much better. But it needs a, a national coast-to-coast -coast discussion and dialogue. And clearly, we are on the scientific part. I am a pediatrician, but I'm not claiming that this is a simple problem. Okay. Thanks, Giddy. Um, we don't have any more questions at this point, and I just want to take this opportunity to do two things. Just to point out one of the secondary but tremendous benefits of us and that's the many many people who are online with us this afternoon those that have been with us on previous webinars as well we are all part of a team now that can really continue to move the goals and objectives one being to increase the awareness of this problem be to begin to address some of these ethical questions that are being asked or for us to identify, as um, Christine Locke just did a few minutes ago, some other, um, some other opportunities for screening for babies who have specific problems as per the, um, the, uh, the cleft palate example that uh, Christine Locke Locke brought to our attention a few minutes ago. So Christine, thank you for that. I think really the, the point that I'm wanting to stress here is we are going to, first of all, as you know, we're recording these webinars. We're going to be able to present them back to everyone who's participated, but also those who have not had an opportunity to participate. And we're going to continue to build on your voices, your um, feedback to us on really some key questions that we need to answer that have not been addressed as yet and also I'm hoping for future opportunities as we continue to move this important work forward. Um, at this point in time I just wanted to 
point out that our next webinar in our continued series is going to, in fact, be on the maladaptive behavior screening tools, and that specifically our neurobehavioral uh, screening tool, uh, part of our kit, and as well as our screening for youth probation officers. So neurobehavioral screening and youth probation officer tools will be presented on Wednesday, June the 1st, uh, always at the same time, 1 to 2.30 Eastern. Our fifth webinar, which will focus on the medicine wheel screening tools, and we'll bring our experts from that area, um, and that will be on Thursday, June the 30th, uh, also from 1 to 2.30 Eastern time. And then apropos to many of the discussions today around the ethics of meconium screening, that is actually going to be presented and we will uh, record and have it available for you on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network. But that, in fact, is going to be a face-to-face uh, -face debate, if you will, and presentation as part of the FACE annual meeting this year in Prince Edward Island. And that will be held on September the 12th. And CAFC will be disseminating uh, more information about uh, all of those events through our uh, various email blasts. And of course, this is all posted on our CAFC website and the Knowledge Exchange Network. At this point, um, I would like to officially bring our webinar to, uh, to a close. And I want to once again thank Dr. Gideon Porin and Dr. Momita Sarkar for just a tremendous uh, presentation as well as engagement um, with so many of our colleagues across the country. And finally, to you, to all of our participants, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Um, your feedback, your questions, and your participation is really a big part in, in the leadership of moving this work forward. So I wish everybody a good remainder of the day in whatever part of the country and or world that you're joining us from. And uh, we'll look forward to welcoming everybody back uh, to our fourth webinar on June the 1st. Thank you, everyone.